We'll begin reading with the first verse and read through verse 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. You know, most people are afraid to tell you what their favorite television show is because they're ashamed of what it is. Have you ever gone into a house to visit someone at night and they're sitting there watching, you know, some rinky-dink TV show and they say, oh, the kids were watching this, let me turn it off. Uh, many of us would be af afraid, ashamed to uh, tell what our favorite TV show is because we're, we're ashamed to admit that it's a soap opera that comes on in the afternoon. John's other wife's other husband's cousin's brother's sister's wife. And, uh, <clears throat> but I want to tell you tonight what one of my favorite TV shows is. Mission Impossible. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> That's one of my favorite shows. The thing I like best about it is that if somebody comes in after it's been going on for a few minutes and says, what's going on, I can say, no use telling you. If you knew, it wouldn't make any difference. <laughs> you never know what's going on. You talk about the precarious position some of those fellas get into. You just know that they've had it. But I've been watching that thing now for years. <laughs> and I want you to know, I don't care how dangerous it is. I don't care how many slip-ups they make. I don't care how many times they get caught. I don't care how many times they're shot at or whatever. They always come out okay. You'll see all four of them or five of them, however many is on right now, get into the car at the end while the other fellow's being dragged off somewhere and drive off into the sunset. They always come out right, no matter what. Don't worry. Hang in there. Everything's going to turn out all right. I like that. You know why everything always turns out okay? They're all following the same script. And you know from the minute that it starts, don't get up tight, no matter how bad it looks, everything will come out all right because they've all read the script and every one of them stick into it. I've often wondered what would happen if one of them didn't stick to the script sometime. But everything will always work out okay. You don't need to worry about it because they're all following the same script. Wouldn't it be great if life was like that? Wouldn't it be great if there was a script that had already been written and you could be assured of having fullness of life and victory in life. All you had to do was stick to the script. Well, as a matter of fact, that's exactly what's happened. That is exactly what has happened. Just as the end of that television show has been predetermined by the writer... So everything about human history, the revolving will of circumstance of human history, there is no mystery how it's all going to turn out, folks. It's all going to be okay. Because a script has been written 
And whether he knows it or not, the devil is moving right along according to script. I like to think about the fact that the devil always overplays his hand. Have you ever thought about that? I was sitting, listening to a preacher up in Philadelphia the other day and began to write. <laughs> I hope that's not what you do when I'm preaching a sermon. You think about something else and write it down. But one of these fellows was waxing eloquent up there and a thought came to me and I just began to write down some things. And the thought that came to me is the devil always overplays his hand. He just always goes too far. And I thought about when Moses was born, and of course the devil knew that this was the baby God was going to use to deliver his uh, nation, Israel. And so he put it in the heart of Pharaoh to kill all the male children uh, two years a old and under. And so his mother went and hid him in the bulrushes in a little makeshift canoe. And you know what happened? Pharaoh's daughter came down there and found him. And I heard someone say the other day, God made an Arab love a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> and Pharaoh's daughter fell in love with that little baby Moses. Now listen to this. And even hired Moses' mother to be the babysitter. And the devil had to pay his diaper bill. <laughs> He was raised in a Pharaoh's palace. The devil footed the bill for the whole thing. He got an education in the culture he would never have had. The devil overplayed his hand. You go to the cross and the devil did it again. He always overplays his hand. And when the devil did his worst, God did his best. And I don't care what the devil does in your life. God's going to make sure he sticks to the script. And when the devil came to God and said, have, uh, God said, have you considered my servant Job? And the devil said, all right, I'll tell you what you do. If you remove that hedge you have round about him and I let me get at that boy, you'll see that he's not going to be near the fellow you think he is. And you read it there in the book of Job. God outlined perfectly in detail what the devil could do to him. And the devil had to come in and report to God every once in a while because God was going to make certain that the devil stuck to the script. And I want you to know that the Christian who knows this book and follows this book and obeys this book is following the script and friend, everything's going to turn out all right. And I don't think it's better illustrated anywhere in the Word of God as it is in the temptation that the devil offered to Jesus. Now we said last Sunday night that when the devil, Luke records, that when the devil had ended all his temptation, he departed. And we said that that didn't mean that the devil was finished with tempting Jesus, but what that meant was he threw everything he had at Jesus and he exhausted every temptation he had and so he left him. And the devil offered three temptations to Jesus and that's the only three temptations he ever had. And I want you to know the devil will always stick to the script. When the devil comes to you to tempt you, he will never, he will never deviate from that threefold temptation. It might come in a thousand and one different guises, but it'll all boil down to one of these three temptations, or one or two, or maybe all three. He will attack you at your physical appetite, he will attack you at your spiritual allegiance, your faith in God, or he will attack you in your personal ambition. Those three temptations that he offered to Jesus, that's all he has. And no matter what form the temptation takes, it will always be one of these three. He will always follow the script. But not only that, the answers that Jesus gave are always the three answers to give to every temptation that the devil offers you. You see, Satan was following the script, and so was Jesus. Because every time Satan offered a temptation to Jesus, Jesus looked up the script and saw what the script said, and he said, it is written... Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, friends, let's take a cue from Jesus and stick to the script. And every time that Jesus met the temptation of the devil, he turned to the word of God and offered to him the authority of the word of God, and by that he overcame the temptation of the devil. There is no reason why any Christian should ever be caught unawares in this matter of temptation. And there is no reason why any Christian should ever go down in defeat before the temptation of the devil 
if you stick to the script. Now, I cannot overemphasize tonight the importance of this incident that we have revealed to us here in the Word of God. I've studied these chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke and tried as best I know how to study the temptation of Jesus, and I confess to you tonight, I feel like I still haven't understood it all. I cannot overemphasize the extreme importance of this temptation. As I said last Sunday night, it reveals to us the way the devil operates. It reveals to us his M.O., his method of operation. And we saw last Sunday night the three temptations that the devil gives. Tonight we're going to look at the three answers that Jesus gave. The devil has only three knocks at his door, and it's very important for you to have prepared what you're going to say when the devil knocks at that door. How are you going to answer the devil's knock at the door of your heart? What we're going to do is to see how Jesus answered that, and that is the key to overcoming temptation every day of your life. Now, someone asked me not long ago, was this a real temptation that Jesus encountered? You know, a great many people are worried about this idea of the humanity of Jesus. And some have gone so far in defending the deity of Jesus, they have destroyed his humanity. But we understand that it is just as vital for Jesus to be human as it is for him to be divine. Jesus must be a human being or he cannot be identified with us in the sacrifice of the cross. His humanity is essential. It was not a mock humanity, it was a real humanity. And the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus Christ was tempted in all points such as we, yet without sin. That simply means the only difference in the temptation of Jesus and the temptation of me is Jesus never yielded. He never succumbed. He was tempted in all points. Now, friends... If this was not a real temptation, if they were just going through a mock temptation, then this places Jesus beyond the moral nature of a human being, and he's not really human. This was a real, intense temptation. It was so intense and so strong that when the temptation was finished, the angels had to come and minister to him. Now, they've never had to do that to you after a temptation. You've never known the severity of temptation such as Jesus knew. It was so intense that the angels had to come and strengthen him after that temptation. It was a very real temptation. And the most important part of it all is this, that when Jesus met the devil yonder in the wilderness, faced that free, temptful temptation, Jesus never once dipped into the treasury of his divine knowledge and power to meet the devil. He never did. Jesus did not use anything that is not available to us. And I want us to see that the way Jesus overcame temptation is the pattern for my overcoming temptation. Three things that are essential, three attitudes that you must have tonight if you're going to overcome the temptation that the devil throws to you. Number one is this. There must be total submission to the Word of God. Total submission to the Word of God. Let's look at that first temptation, verse 3. Now remember, Jesus has been fasting for 40 days. Remember, he's in the wilderness. Now hang on to that thought because it's going to parallel something we'll see in just a moment. Jesus is in the wilderness, and if I happen to forget to mention that, you remind me of it because I don't want to forget to tell you what the significance of that is. Jesus is in the wilderness, and he's been fasting for 40 days. Now, notice what the devil does. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, the devil was appealing to his deity. He said, You're the Son of God. You have all power. Use a little bit of that divine power. Command these stones to be made bread. But I want you to notice the way Jesus answered, and it's so precious. Jesus said, Satan, you're appealing to me on the wrong grounds. Notice what he says. He answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Immediately Jesus classified himself with you and me. The devil said, if you're the son of God, 
face up to it and meet this temptation on the basis of your deity. Jesus said, I will not meet this temptation on the basis of my deity. I am going to forget that I am the Son of God. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And when Jesus uttered that, he was classifying himself with me and classifying himself with you. Jesus was saying, I am going to meet you, Satan, on the level of humanity. Because if I don't, all of my followers are going to be sunk. They must see that I met you and conquered you on the basis of human level, or they'll not have any victory themselves. So he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, we preachers have done a disservice to a great many people because we have said the way to overcome the devil is to quote Scripture to him. That is not true. I want you to know that I have quoted tons of Scripture to the devil and gone down in defeat while I was quoting the last verse. Jesus did more than merely quote Scripture to the devil. He not only quoted that Scripture, he submitted himself to the authority of that Scripture. That's the important thing. You can quote Scripture all day long to the devil, but if you are not totally submitted to the Word of God and obedient to the Word of God, and if you're not living according to the Word of God, there is no power there in merely quoting it. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, the devil had what many of us have tonight, a very shallow view of life. Now, I don't want you to miss this. Friends, if you think that your life subsists by bread, then you'll do everything in your power to get bread. But if you ever come to the place to realize that you don't live by bread, you live by the Word of God, then you'll do everything in your power to obey the Word of God. And right here at this point is where you're failing. The devil says you've got to have bread if you're going to live. Jesus said, you're wrong. You're not alive tonight because you eat three meals a day and breathe air and go to the doctor and take medicine. You're alive tonight because God's Word has decreed that you are alive. You can die on a full stomach. Friends, it is not bread that keeps us alive. It is not fresh air that keeps us alive. It is not doctors and surgery and medicine that keeps us alive. It is the decree of God that keeps us alive. And God has been pleased to use the instrument of bread to sustain our life, but God could keep me alive for a hundred years without ever eating if he wanted to. It is not bread that keeps me alive. It is the decree of God. And if God wants me to live without bread, I can do it. And if you believe that your life is sustained by bread, then you'll do everything in your power to get bread. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. He lives by the Word of God. If God says, I'm going to live, all the hosts of hell can't kill me. Now, Jesus is in the wilderness. Now, Jesus quotes three Old Testament scriptures. Now, every one of these quotations come from the book of Deuteronomy. And you know what the book of Deuteronomy is? That's a walk down memory lane. Moses is about to die... And he's taking all the people of Israel back down memory lane and he's telling them all that happened in the wilderness. Now, here is the significant thing about this wilderness. Every one of these quotations from the mouth of Jesus were originally spoken to Israel while Israel was in the wilderness despairing of its life. Oh, let's look over that Exodus chapter 17. I don't care how bad this church gets and how hard it is to pass at this church. I get a lot of comfort out of, out of Moses. <laughs> the people are always turning against Moses. Bless his heart. <laughs> Every time they... And you know, Moses could perform a miracle and get water out of a rock, blood out of a turnip, part the Red Seas, destroy Pharaoh's army... But over the next hill, the people are dropping, murmuring, and saying, Moses, what have you done? All right, let's read Exodus chapter 17. There was no water for the people to drink, verse 1. Wherefore the, Moses did chide, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. 
And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And then you over in verse 7, he said, they said, And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel. They said, Moses, you got us in this forward program leading us out here to the promised land, and now there's no water, there's no food, we're going to starve. You remember once in Exodus chapter 14, they said, Moses, weren't there enough graves in Egypt? Did you, were all the cemetery plots taken up in Egypt? Did you have to get us out here where there's more room to bury us? Every time they were saying, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. And every time God miraculously opened the waters. And every time God miraculously fed them with manna from heaven. Every time God miraculously spared their lives. And so in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is recounting that experience. And he says, God led you through the wilderness and he made you hungry. But he also fed you that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so here is Jesus now, the new Israel, the head of the new race. Where is he? In the wilderness. Starving to death. And old Satan... He doesn't have any new tricks in his bag. The same temptation he used with Israel to get them to murmur and gripe out yonder thousands of years ago in the wilderness when they were starving. He used his own Jesus, and Jesus says, Devil, God's never changed. The Word of God has never changed. And when you came to the people of Israel thousands of years ago out yonder in the wilderness and got them to gripe and complain and chide, the word there came, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And Jesus said, it's still good today. It'll still work on him today. Now, I don't care what wilderness you go through, and I don't care how the devil tempts you, you need to understand tonight, my friend, that you do not live by bread alone, but you live by the word of God. You live by the word of God. You remember when Paul was going to Rome? And the storm came up and the ship was about to be lost and all the lives were about to be lost. And that night an angel came and paid a visit to the Apostle Paul and that angel confirmed with the Apostle Paul that nobody on that ship would die. The next day Paul stood in the midst of that people and he said, Brothers, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. For there stood by me this night the angel of God whose servant I am and he told me there should be no loss of this ship. No loss of any lives, but only the ship. You see what he was saying? Paul was saying, all of you specialists, all of you seamen, you mariners, you've said that this ship is going to crack up, that we're all going to die. But he said, I want you to know man does not live by the ability of seamanship. He lives by the Word of God. And there stood by me this night the angel of God. I'm banking it all on the Word of God. You see what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, Satan, and he's saying to you and to me, he doesn't, he doesn't have to keep you alive with bread. He just does it that way right now. But if he wanted to keep you alive without bread, he could. You don't live by bread. Your life does not consist in the abundance of the things that you possess, but your life consists in the Word of God. And you know, how in the world could Jesus stand out there for 40 days and not be hungry? It says that afterward he was hungry. Did you notice that in verse 2? And when the tempter, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungry. You remember in John chapter 4, when Jesus and his disciples were passing through Samaria, and Jesus was hungry, he was so famished he didn't even have the strength to walk into the town, and so he said to his disciples, probably something like this, I'll wait here beside this well, and you fellas, you go on into town and get me something to eat. And so they go into town. And in the meantime, Jesus had a divine appointment with that woman. And he led her to himself. And the disciples came back and they said, Master, we, we've, uh, we've got the groceries. Here's the food. Jesus said, I'm not hungry. <laughs> not hungry? And the Bible says they wondered among themselves, who did give him to eat? He was so famished, he was so weak from hunger that he couldn't even go into the city. We told him to wait here. We'd get food. Now we have the food. He's not hungry. He's ready to go. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. My meat is to do the will of God. Now let me repeat that statement I made earlier. You see what is the significance of this, teenagers? 
If you think your life consists in popularity, you'll do everything in your power to be popular. You'll compromise. You'll do anything to be popular. Businessman, if you think your life, the fullness of your life, consists in the bread that you can win, in the possessions that you can acquire, then you'll do everything in your power to get that. Wife, if you think your life consists in the social position and you push, push, push your husband to get more and to raise your life up to that social standing that you think you're worthy of, then you'll do everything in your power to do that. I want to tell you something else, parents. If you think that the life of your children depends upon all the things you can get them and all the material things you can heap upon them, you'll do everything in your power to get that. But if you ever come to the place to realize Bread is beside the point. Clothing is beside the point. Raiment is beside the point. Shelter is beside the point. Man does not live by bread alone. He lives by the Word of God. Then you'll do everything in your power to make certain you're submitted to that Word and live by that Word. I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything tonight in this world that I would give in exchange for the ability to go to that Word and get the message from God for my life. And I want you to know there's something about being able to face the day with the assurance. God's Word says I'm victorious. God's Word says this. And I am submitting myself, I'm betting my life, I'm banking my life on the Word of God. And that's the way to overcome the devil. Not just quoting Scripture to him, but total submission to the Word of God. All right, let's hurry on now. Secondly, there must not only be total submission to the Word of God, there must in the second place be total submission to the will of God. Total submission to the will of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, in Exodus chapter 17, this is what the people did. What does it mean to tempt the Lord thy God? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that one of the reasons God destroyed so many thousands of the people is because they tempted Christ. What does it mean to tempt the Lord thy God? To tempt the Lord means to presume upon God's goodness and to trade on your relationship with Him. Now, get this fixed in your mind. Satan said, Jesus, I'll tell you how you can get a crowd. You want everybody to listen to you, I'll tell you what you do. If you'll get up there on the pinnacle of the temple and throw yourself off and let that angel come down that God has placed as a guardian over you, let him swoop down and catch you up everywhere you go, you can put on your posters the man that was saved by an angel. And everybody will know that you're the Son of God. It will be indisputable evidence that you are the Son of God. And Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Here's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, Don't make me dissatisfied with the way God's arranging things and try to get me to take matters into my own hands and change the will of God for my life. Now, I just want to say a brief word about this. The hardest thing for any of us to ever accept is the will of God for our life. That's why when we preached that message this morning, we said it is so important for a parent to teach his child discipline and submission because that child must learn to submit his will to somebody else. And I submit to you tonight that the most difficult thing in your life is to be content with the will of God for your life. And when God was leading the people through Israel and things didn't go they want, the way they thought they ought to go, they began to criticize, they began to tempt God, they began to gripe, they began to m complain. Why? Because they were not content with the way God was arranging and running their life. And they said, we're not going to put up with the way things are. We're going to take matters into our own hands and we're going to do what we want to do. And he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And what Jesus is saying here is this. 
Satan, I am totally submissive to the will of God. I know right now, devil, I'm starving to death. I know I've been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. I know my situation is perilous, but I know this much. I know that my life is in the hands of God, and I'm not going to tempt God by complaining and criticizing and by trying to change the way God has ordered things for my life. I am going to submit to the will of God and say, Father, whatever you want to arrange in my life, whatever wilderness you want to take me through, whatever sorrow you want to take me through, whatever difficulty you want to take me through, I submit to your will, and I will not take advantage of anything that I have to change the will of God. And the devil will come to you and try to get you to be dissatisfied with the way God is running your life. Total submission to the will of God. Now let's hurry on because I want to finish this last one. Not only must there be total submission to the word of God and total submission to the will of God, and this is the clincher, there must be total submission to the worship of God. Verse 8, Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee. Now here's where the devil really comes out in the open. If thou wilt fall down and worship me, and that's what he wanted all along. If thou wilt fall down and worship me, then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It all boils down, and this is the crux of the whole question of temptation, it all boils down to this. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to worship? Now, what does it mean to worship God? Friends, do not make the mistake of thinking that when you come to church on Sunday morning or Sunday night and you fold your hands and say a prayer and meditate that you have worshiped, that is not worship. I want to show you what worship is. You have it right there in that verse. I wonder if you noticed it. Did you notice it? Jesus told you what worship was. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and what? And him only shalt thou serve. Now listen. You work for who you worship. You work for who you worship. Whoever it is you're worshiping tonight, that's who you're working for. You always serve the person, the thing, the God you worship. What does it mean to worship God? I'll tell you exactly what it means to worship God. It means that you put God first in every area of your life and Him and Him only you serve. Now, I think we need to read the background of this. You listen as I read in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And it shall be... When the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells dig which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, now listen to that, he says, when I have brought you into a land that you didn't work for that I gave you, when you have eaten and when you are full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And some of you tonight in this place have forgotten that it was God that did it all. When you have come into the land, when you're full, when, you're, when you've eaten, when everything is going your way, beware lest you forget that it was God who did it all. And I tell you, you walk up and down the streets and go into the homes and into the shops and the offices of a great many people where Christians live and see the way they live and hear the way they talk, and you would say they have forgotten that it was Jesus who saved them back yonder on Calvary thousands of years ago. Thou shalt fear him, it goes on to say, and serve him. And I'll tell you what the greatest danger is to these teenagers and young people sitting up behind me tomorrow when they go out into the world and this fall when school starts is to forget about Jesus and begin serving other gods. You know, Irving is a city. And many of you folks came from smaller towns. 
How many of you tonight moved to Dallas from a smaller town? I want to tell you, some of you are not living for God like you did back home. Some of you are not living for God like you did back home. You've come to the big city, got to make a living, got to make a buck. You see, when the people of Israel went over into the new land, they'd always been sheep herders and brick masons. You know how they fell into idolatry? The people over there said, now listen, you Jews, it's all right for you to be sheep herders and all right for you to make bricks in Egypt. But he said, I want you to know that you're in agricultural land now. This is farming country. And he said, I know you had a God over there that helped you herd sheep and helped you make bricks. But he said, that God that you had back home won't do for this new land. This is agricultural land. This is farming land. And you'd better get with the farming God. And you know why the children of Israel fell into idolatry every new country they went into? Because they swallowed that lie of the devil. They say, this is a new land, this is a new country, things are different here, and you've got to bow down to the God of this land. And I'll tell you, that's exactly what some teenagers do when they go off to college. They say, well, man, the God I had back at good old home and good old Irving was all right, but this is a new world, this is a new scene, and that same old faith and same old convictions and same old God just won't cut it here at school. And you change gods. And you've forgotten when you're full and when you've eaten, you've forgotten about Jesus. I speak to some young businessman. Man, you got baptized into the business world, and it's dog eat dog, and even a cat once in a while, and it's every man for himself. And you know what the devil tells you? He says, listen, that God you had when you were in high school, and that God you had back there when you were doing that little bit of work, won't do. That God won't make it here in this big city. This is the big world. This is the world where it really happens, and you've got to get with the God of this world. And I tell you tonight, some of you have swallowed it. He said, when you come into the land, when you get to the big city, and you begin to grow up, and you begin to move out into new areas and meet new people, beware, lest you forget. Remember who your God is. Remember who your God is. And when the devil came to Jesus, and he said, listen, you fall down and worship me and I'll get everything you want. I'll make it easy for you. Jesus said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. And when Jesus was kneeling there in the Garden of Gethsemane and we can only imagine what transpired there, but perhaps again the devil came to him and said, Hey, you remember that sight I showed you three and a half years ago? All the kingdoms and the glory in a moment. If you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give it to you. And I can hear Jesus perhaps that he said, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And I want you to know that tomorrow when the devil comes to you and he tempts you to lust and tempts you to compromise and tempts you to sin and tempts you to cheat, you just say, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Total submission to the worship of God. The worship of God. And the Bible says, that when Jesus met the devil on these three lines, the devil left him. Now, let me repeat them, and I promise you on the authority of the Word of God tonight, if these three attitudes are true in your life, you can meet anything the devil throws at you and emerge on the other side victorious. Total submission to the Word of God. Are you totally submitted to the Word of God tonight? Can you think of a command in the Bible that you're not obeying? Huh? Are you totally submitted to the Word of God tonight? Are you totally submitted to the will of God? God, whatever you want to do in my life, whatever you want to do with this life, no matter if it seems bad to me, I submit myself. I will not tempt you by becoming dissatisfied and trying to change your will. I totally submit to your will. Are you totally submitted tonight to the worship of God? And by that I mean, who are you serving? Thank you for listening to this message by Ron Dunn. Ron Dunn's messages are for personal edification, not to be duplicated, uploaded to the web, or resold without prior written permission. 
The Ron Dunn Audio Library is managed by Sherwood Baptist Church. For more Ron Dunn materials, including sermon outlines, devotions, scanned pages from a study Bible, books, CDs, MP3s, and DVDs, visit rondunn.com or the Sherwood Baptist Bookstore, The Source. Sermons are also available on the Ron Dunn Podcast.